so now we're going to go in a completely different direction from software. And uh, if what we sort of just uh, covered was um, being high tech, then this presentation is really all about being high touch. And uh, as we know, the most uh, valuable asset in our business you know, are our people. And so what we're going to be talking about is culture and also how to uh, build a world-class team. So our next speaker uh, started his business uh, 14 years ago from a spare bedroom in his house and has now grown it to the point where he now has 130 staff. And in fact, he was telling me that next week he's going to be onboarding 11 new staff members uh, next week. So that's the amount of growth that his company has experienced. Uh, he has been listed in BRW's uh, best places to work for not just one or two or three years running, but for the last nine years running. He's been listed, which is pretty incredible. And, uh, and he even won um, the uh, number one place to work as well, which is just incredible. Now, you'll be pleased to know that when it comes to being one of the best places to work, he told me before, you don't need to have a, a slippery slide or a foosball table or, you know, all of that other stuff that, uh, you know, companies like Google have. In fact, his company even beat Google for a best place to work uh, in one of those years. So um, he's going to share with you um, his kind of secrets to success, why culture kind of matters, how to build an amazing team and how to be a great place uh, for employees to work and how to then use that to your advantage to get more done and to, to dramatically grow your business like he's been able to do. So let's give him a huge round of applause as he comes up. Tristan White, everybody. Thanks. All right. Dale, thank you for the invitation. Wonderful, wonderful to be here with you. And I am so excited about sharing this Culture is Everything system with you. Because if there's one thing that I love, it's being in a room full of entrepreneurs who've got a dream to do something big, different, exciting, and most importantly, useful in the world. Am I in the right room? Yes. yes. Excellent. Who has got a vision for their business? Excellent. Whose vision involves them needing to employ people. Thank you. Who's already got people in their team? Great, 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 great. All right, the reason I ask those questions is because to do something useful in the world, to build a business, to do something which is valuable, we're almost always gonna need to work with other people. Now, I may not be the only person in the room, and if, you, if I am, it's okay, because different's okay. But I don't really love spending all of my time with other people. Is there anyone else like me? Thank you. Thank you. If I could, I would probably choose to spend my life on my own. <laughs> I get energy from being on my own. I expend energy by being with other people. Sound familiar? But here's the thing. To do something significant in the world, we have to engage with other people. And the way we can do it, the way we can do it is to think through what is our vision, what are we about, and put it in a system or a way that will help us build a team that can protect our own energy protect our own strength, and hopefully protect us from the time it can take working with people when we don't have the culture in our business in the way we want it. Does that make any sense? Fantastic, fantastic. All right, I want to, I want to share with you today some learnings that I've had as 14, 14 years as an entrepreneur. Hard to believe hard to believe. Someone asked me, uh, this week just gone, I started the week uh, outside, I live in country Victoria in a teeny tiny little town called Foster with one, who knows Foster? Yes, 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 yes. You went to school there. I love it. I love it. 
I woke up there this morning. I woke up. Yeah. I, 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 so I'm from a tiny town called Foster, 1,000 friendly people, uh, two and a quarter hours southeast of Melbourne. Uh, someone's heckling me already. Um, <laughs> and, but here's the thing. I woke up there on Sunday morning. I drove to Melbourne. And then on Monday morning, I've been to a quick trip to Adelaide. And I've been celebrating a party with our Adelaide team, the Physio Co., our 14th birthday party. And then on Tuesday, I've been here to Sydney to celebrate with our Sydney team our 14th birthday party. And then I went to Melbourne. And on Melbourne West, I celebrate our 14th birthday party. And on Thursday, Melbourne East, 14th birthday party. Four birthday parties in one week. And someone said to me, Tristan, how does it feel to have this team that's got 130 people and you've been celebrating this party and, and all week? And I'm like, it feels unbelievable. And I've got no freaking idea how it happened. Okay? But what I've been doing is doing two things, and two things that us entrepreneurs need to be doing all the time. One is peering off into the future at that vision as to what I'd like this to grow to and build to over a period of time. And at the same time I'm peering off there, I'm peering right down here. What do I need to do today, this week, this month, and this quarter to move us one step towards where that vision will be? One step, and this dual focus always peering off into the future, but always bringing it back to the action that needs to happen is such an important lesson that I've learned. (coughs) And one of my mentors once told me that the most important job of a business owner is to stay in business. Pretty simple, pretty simple concept. But if you can't stay in business, there's no way to keep the dream alive, to keep growing and doing and doing the useful things in life. So I tell you those couple of things because I wanted to give you a little bit of insight as to what um, my background. But let's go back to the start. Can I have your permission to go back to the start of where it all began at the PhysioCo? Yeah. Thank you. Important part of the story, I, I am a physiotherapist. I'm a qualified physiotherapist. I went to school in Foster. I then went to uni in Melbourne, and I qualified to be a physio. And at the end of my four years at uni, I had a bit of a plan. I'm a dreamer. I reckon I'm in a room full of dreamers. Dreamers around the place? Yeah, nice, 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 nice. I had a plan. I had a 10-year plan for the first part of my career. And it went something like this finish uni, move in, start working in the public hospital system, a big teaching hospital where I could learn the basics as a junior physio, move into private practice, being a hands-on um, physio, and hopefully progress in that field. Hopefully move on to learn and get into the field of sports medicine. And one day, after a 10-year learning, growing, doing my very best, doing my time, I would hopefully be a partner in a busy sports physio practice, and the cream de resistance would be remembering I'm from Victoria, is that the mighty Richmond Tigers (laughs) would... (laughs) would need me to be their physio. That was the career dream. And I had a very, very, very early pivot. And pivots are so important in our entrepreneurial careers. Because I didn't even start, I didn't even make the first leap into that 10-year career. Because after my physio degree, I felt like I couldn't stomach the idea of working in the constricted environment of a large teaching hospital as a physiotherapist. Remembering 14 years on, I've discovered that entrepreneurship is for me. I didn't know it at the time but the confines of a large teaching hospital did not seem like for me. So I skipped forward on the plan, and I started working in a group of private practices. A growing group of practices, I got to, I'd skip forward a couple of years, and what my life looked like for that first year of my physio career was working out of a small treatment room in this busy practice, and every 20 or 30 minutes, a new, a new patient would come in to see me. 
And as a 23-year-old recently graduated physio, I was, my eyes were as wide as you could possibly imagine. Okay. I am listening as closely as I can. I am doing my very best to figure out what is the challenges with my clients. I'm doing my very best to build rapport, to, to manage my time, to stay on time, and do all these things. And then three nights a week, I'm heading off to the, to the local under-18 football club where I'm learning the ropes as a sports physio, and weekends I'm being the physio as they're on field for the, um, the under-18 team. And I did this for a year. And during that year, throughout the year, if you had have asked me how my career was going, my goodness, you would have seen some nice chest beating because I thought to myself I'd skip forward on this career, skip forward on this 10-year plan. But I had another pivot at the end of that year okay? because what it turns out, and I must have been the most naive young physio going around, the most naive, the most probably full of myself young physio going around because I didn't realise that having a new patient coming through the door every 20 or 30 minutes would suck the life out of me. Because my patients were injured. Of course they were injured. But their energy levels were low. Of course their energy levels were low. Okay? But working with clients who were injured and every 20 minutes they'd come in and I'd ask them, what can I do for you today? And they would tell me about their challenges for me as an entrepreneur, was a really, really difficult situation to find myself in. And as for working with elite sports people, I didn't feel like I was doing a meaningful contribution to their lives. Most of those under-18 kids who I worked with were functioning at such high levels, they needed me to help them run faster, jump higher, tackle harder. But was I really making a difference in their lives? I didn't feel like it. I, didn't, I felt like I was making healthy people healthier. And so I left that early career choice, and I went back home and lived with my parents. And now I've been to uni for five years, it took me five years to get the degree, degree done. I've worked for one year. I'm living at home with my parents with no idea what I'm going to do. And I reflected long and hard and I realised that there was a certain patient or type of patient that I liked to work with which gave me real satisfaction. Something I felt I could make a meaningful contribution to their life and they would also return the energy and be grateful for the interaction that I gave them. And so in early 2004, 14 years ago, February 2004, I started working as a part-time 12-hour per week physiotherapist at a pretty old and pretty tired nursing home in the inner northern suburbs of Melbourne. And I met people like George, George's roommate Les, the lady down the corridor whose name was Marjorie, and these wonderful, wonderful people who I got to work with helping... And what's turned out that helping older people stay mobile, safe and happy was a pivot that I needed to take in the early part of my career and then to the next part of my career until I figured out that purpose, what was meaningful to me, was where I wanted to work. And so 14 years ago, the most important part of this journey and there's been so many challenges in that 14 years, but the most important part is why I'm there in the first place. What I can do, how I can be useful in the world. And helping George stay mobile, safe and happy, so he could fulfil his dream of getting out of that nursing home and going home to spend at least some time with his wife Mavis, their, their kids and grandkids in their, in their family home just around the corner was the most amazingly powerful thing that I could discover that would set me on this entrepreneurial journey. And the vision came later on. The vision came later, but the purpose, the way that I could be useful to other people, was the starting point 
for how I started my business and then over time we've built this strong culture and moved on from there. Does that make any sense? Fantastic, fantastic. Let's, so the quick, quick rest of the startup story goes, I started working 12 hours per week with George. Over that next year, I was very fortunate to, be, to do a reasonable job, get introduced to some other nursing home managers, and by the end of the first year, I'm flat out dashing around from nursing home to nursing home, working about six, six to seven days a week. The only thing I can possibly do, because I've got all these people to help out, is to ask for help. And ask for help for me meant starting to recruit and, and employ other physiotherapists. And in early 2005, we added more, uh, the, our first part-time physiotherapist, and over the next few years, it's all we did. Help more people, add more team members, help more people, add more team members, help more people, add more team members, and forgot the critical bit that you guys are learning all about, and that's systems. And I got to the fifth year mark of our business, and I'd recruited 20 physios. I had a team of 20 people. They're all reporting to me. I was still trying to dash around and see a few patients. I had my sister doing payroll. I had a mate of mine helping me out, supposedly managing. I had a huge freaking mess, is what I had. That's what I had. Who's found themselves in a huge freaking mess, mess at any point in time? Absolutely, you know what I'm talking about. I was stressed. I was super stressed. Two options, I felt like I had two options. I've since learnt, learnt or at least Tony Robbins tells me, that in any situation there's at least three. We could challenge Tony if he was here, but I, he's really big, you know? Um, but I felt like I had two options. Get out. This entrepreneurial thing is not for you, Tristan. It was a nice idea. Get, get small again, get back to helping George, helping the people out, don't bother about being a team. Or find a solution. Find a way to do it. I'm not really into giving up. And so I went looking for a solution, and it was at this point, at the five-year mark of our business in 2009, when I discovered this idea of a values-based business. Using a set of core values, a set of systems and processes built around principles of core purpose, core values, vision, and effectively saying that culture is everything. If I get the culture right and I build the systems around supporting the culture to deliver more and more services to people like George, then I think that I can continue on this journey. And so I share that with you because you guys are so far ahead of where I was. So far ahead, you've, you've, you're here in this program, you're working on your vision, you're working on your systems, you've got at least one year, many of you multiple years in this program with these, this isn't in place. And I wanna share with you some of the things that I've learned growing from that 20 person mess to where we are, 130 people this week, 140, we'll have 141 by Tuesday of next, of next week. And that's the journey and that's the challenges I want to share with you. But please, if, it, if I share some things and you're like, oh, geez, Tristan, you make it sound so bloody easy, please remember it comes from all these lessons that come from absolute learnings from pain. Uh, and I might dress it up in a presentation, a business blueprint, uh, but I assure you the, su the suffering is strong uh, and the suffering is part of the way we've done this. Best part of our team, yes, Dale's gave me a wonderful introduction. We have been one of Australia's best places to work. Uh, this slide is a critical, critical part of what I'm about to share with you, and that is culture can be a repeatable system in your business. Many, many, many people believe and think that culture is this intangible concept, the airy-fairy stuff, the perks you give to staff, or the slippery slide you put into the office, or the culture days you have, the, the morale seems a bit low, so let's smack on a culture day. That's not the stuff, in my view, in my experience. I'm not saying it doesn't help, 
but unless there's an, a system beneath it to really build uh, the, the, the culture is everything system is what I've, I've learned, that's where I think you get the real value from and that's where you can release yourself as a business owner to, allow, to put a system in place so you don't have to be completely communicating with every person on every day and to keep this energy alive. So there is something called a culture is everything checklist. It is the 19 steps that we've got in place in our business. Um, you can download it from, from a website. I'll point you to that a little bit later. And there also is a copy of the checklist for everyone to take home with you. At um, uh, Ivy will send them out just a, a little bit later. But the key parts to the culture is everything system that I wanted to share with you today has got four parts. Discover the core, document the future, execute relentlessly, and show more love. Now they are completely and completely interrelated. I've already talked to you about purpose, the reason that, that my business exists, and that's part of Discover the Core. I will then talk about vision, documenting the future that we've all, we all know is so important. So Discover the Core and document the future, potentially two sides of the one coin. Why are we here? Where are we going? Why are we here? Where are we going? The next two, execute relentlessly and show more love. We all know to build a successful business that lasts, we need to execute over and over and over again. But at the same time, as we are laser focused as business owners and entrepreneurs, how can we show more love to the people in our teams to support them and bring them on, bring them on the journey. And that, those two, the combination of two sides of the one coin, the, the bottom two dot points, execute relentlessly, drive this baby hard, but show more love at the same time is not an easy concept. Is not an easy concept. So let's talk about discover the core. First one, who's got a, who's got a set of core values in the business? Awesome. Awesome. Shout it out, how many core values do you have? Five. I'm hearing four, I'm hearing five. Three. Pardon? Three. three, I'm hearing three. Th Say it again. Twelve. Did I hear twelve? Okay, excellent, thank you. The fact that you've got values is brilliant. What they are actually doesn't matter. The fact that you've got core values is the starting point. I was so fortunate to do some work with ANZ last year. I sat on the couch and did a, a Facebook Live with, with ANZ's uh, CEO, Shane Elliott. And he said, Tristan, I can see your core values at the Physio Co. Uh, respect everyone, be memorable, find a better way, and think big, act small. And he said, they're great. I said, thanks, Shane. <laughs> And he said, at ANZ, we've got our, our values, what we call I care, the letters I-C-A-R-E. I can't tell you exactly what each of the five I care values are, but Shane said, Tristan, do you reckon we could swap? I said, that's kind of you, Shane. We could swap. And, he's right. and the reason that he said that is because it doesn't matter what they are, it's what you do with them which is the critical bit in running a values-based business, where you've got core values as a critical way for people, listen closely to the, bless you, bless you, bless you. Listen closely to this one. This is a really important point that I suffered horribly over. I wish people could read my mind. Do you guys wish people could read your mind? I reckon, a well-crafted set of core values with a set of behaviours with them. For example, think big, act small. We, always, we are always prepared to give it a go. We are nimble, flexible and easygoing. We always ask, what can I do next? And we all help to achieve our painted picture of the future is as close as I can get to allowing people to read my mind because I, I communicate it, I make it clear, we make sure everyone knows what those core values and behaviours are, and then we do everything we possibly can to keep them alive and well in our business. We 
interview and select people based upon their ability and their history living core values. We onboard them and train them almost to the nth degree so they know those core values inside out. We have a reward and recognition program, but the only way you're going to get be praised in front of your team members in our business for reward and recognition is not for making sales. It's not for treating the most Georges in the world. It is for being recognised for living the core values, someone catching you doing something right, nominating you and say, I found Kenneth at Ferndale Grange working with his client, living the value of think big, act small, and this is the way he did it. And that is, that is the only way that you're going to get a reward and recognition at the Physio Co to move on to become what would be our MVP of the year, most valuable person of the year. And so in this first part of Discover the Core, core purpose, a really clear reason as to why you exist in a business. Now you might know it as mission, that's A-OK. -okay. I prefer the term core purpose. It's, either one is perfectly fine. But Simon Sinek would say your why. Simon Sinek would say your why. But why are you here? And at the Physio Co, we exist to help seniors stay mobile, safe and happy. That's our core purpose, it's a reason for being, it's our cause, it's our belief. A core purpose and a set in my experience, between three and five core values, which are very clearly um, uh, described. They've got a core value, and then they've got a set of behaviors that go with it, is in my experience the lesson learned on how to set the foundation for a, for a really strong culture. Am I making any sense? Great, thank you. I'm gonna, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna draw something over here Hopefully you'll understand, you'll be able to check it out from my uh, handwriting. But I'm going to draw this firstly, and this is purpose. Oh. Whew. Alrighty. Little nervous moment for the speaker there as the uh, whiteboard almost collapsed, collapsed on me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. All right. Let's keep moving on to document the future. <coughs> we already stuck our hands up to say we've got a vision. Can I ask you to shout out for me if you have a timeline on your vision? Great. Shout the numbers. How, long, how many years is it? One and a half? Four, four two? Thirty, 36 months? Th 36 years, sorry, 36 months, five years, 20 years. Thank you, I like that, that's specific. Um, someone said 10 years, did someone say 10? Excellent, down here, perfect, thank you. So here's my learning over the last 14 years on vision. We know we need a 90-day action plan, and I, I, I'm confident that's part of the business blueprint system, that you have a 90-day action plan. Am I correct in, in saying that? Yes. Absolutely. We know what we need to focus on the next 90 days. I learnt from the research of a fellow called Jim Collins in his very famous book, Good to Great. Who's read Good to Great? He talks about a concept called the big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, it's a long-term goal that is much bigger than ourselves that we, we try and work to over a long period of time. Now, Jim says a BHAG should be between 10 and 20, 10, sorry, 10 and 25 years, lo years long is my understanding of what he says. Now that is a very long time. I'm impressed. I'm impressed over there by the, by the 20. I'm impressed. I was not as brave as you and I chose the lower end of Jim Collins' range, and that is I chose the 10-year range. And we, we've got a vision that we call our 10-year obsession. It's what we're working towards over a long, a 10-year period. Uh, do you need a hand? There you go. Oh, yeah, okay, no, no worries. <laughs> Thanks for your help. Uh, the 10-year obsession. 
And at the Physio Co, our 10-year obsession that we've been working to since 2009 until the 31st of December 2018, this year, this is our 10th year, is together as a team to deliver 2 million consultations to Australian seniors to help them stay mobile, safe and happy. As a team, we set this seemingly ridiculous goal, and I say ridiculous, because if you asked me in 2009 how the hell we're going to deliver two million consultations, I had no idea. I had no idea. But that's the beauty of a vision, a big goal, a Jim Collins style, big, hairy, audacious goal. Yes, there was a little bit, a little bit more science to it than to pick it out of the, out of the um, uh, let's ask, ask me a question about the BHAG a little bit later if you'd like, but in short, a 10 year vision is one that can do something significant over a period of time. But 10 years for most people in your business is too long. That's my experience. Team members, depends, depends on your team members. Some of them can think more than the next month. <laughs> <laughs> That was clearly tailored to you guys. It's, uh, uh, I, um, some team members think in one year, two years, maybe three years. That's pretty much the duration that, in my experience, that people think about. And so my belief, what I've learned from this, this concept, is to have a 10-year obsession that acts as your North Star that we're working towards, and we update people every month in our business. What is the progress towards our 10-year obsession of delivering 2 million consultations to Australian seniors? Because everyone out there doing the doing, whether they're physios out in the field or support team members, are contributing. Every bit they do helps the, the scoreboard tick over and tick over and tick over as we grow towards the 10-year obsession. But I reckon you need to break it down into three year more focused periods. And I call that a painted picture vision. And why I call it a painted picture? I learnt it from someone else. I learnt it from a fellow called Cameron Herald. And he said to me, he said, Tristan, you know those brave souls who compete in the Winter Olympics, the ski jumpers? They tear down from a massive hill, and they get down to the bottom, and then they go off of the ramp, and then they lean into it, for, and they seem to fly through the air for freaking ages. Uh, you know the ones I'm talking about? One of the visioning exercises that they do is that they write, this is the Canadian Olympic team, and they write down what the perfect jump looks like, feels like, at the top of the run as they come down all the way through, and they describe it. And then as they train, they're doing everything they can to get every part of it, of their dream jump, to come to life. It's a visioning exercise, and they lean out into the future to what the perfect jump will look like. And I believe that in our businesses, we need to lean out into the future and describe what the future will look like at a, at a moment in time on the way to our 10-year obsession. So an example. In 2009, when we had our small 20-person team, we set this 10-year obsession to deliver 2 million consultations, then we broke it down into what we need to do in the next three years as the stepping stone or the base camp to, to make that direction. And what was needed was to move from our 20-person team to a 50-person team. What was needed was to move from delivering 40,000 consults per year to 100,000 consultations per year. Now, they seem like big numbers, and they were. They were scary. They were scary. But remembering, this is me understanding the method required to move from a mess to something that's more manageable, more useful, and does something more that I can manage my, my time better as well. And so we released that, that vision. 17 of those 20 team members also were scared as hell, but they were on board. They're like, OK, I understand it. The purpose is useful. The values is useful. I see the vision. I don't know how we're going to do it, but let's work together and let's figure it out. And that's where your 90-day action plans come in as the steps that we take. 
there were three members of the team at that time which were not on board with the next step. I think they liked the mess. I think they liked the lack of accountability that existed in the mess. Sound about right? I think they enjoyed the fact they could pretty much do what they felt like. And here was a vision and a set of behaviours that not only was going to transform us to something much bigger and much more significant, but the magnifying glass was going to shine on the people that were owning it and the people that, who weren't. Exactly. Exactly. And so those three team members, two of them very quickly self-selected and moved on to another job. One of them fought the good fight. <laughs> One of them fought the good fight. And because he'd been working with me for a number of years, and he'd been doing his best. And according to him, what his best was the what we should have been all doing. And up until now, it was somewhat unfair of me to change the goalposts. And I, and I do my very best to empathise with his, his position because um, everything he'd been doing is now being suggested that maybe he's not going to be doing anymore. And that's tough. And that's tough. So as a boss, I joke with you guys about being a boss and about employees, but there's nothing more important, I don't think, than what we need to do is be empathetic to, to the positions of our team members as well. When we understand each other, and we can work together, that's when we can move, move ahead together. But this person and I had to have some one-to-one -one conversations over a period of time, and in the end, we worked together to find him a new professional home. And then we obsessed with those 17 remaining team members to move forth as quickly as we could, and we did hit those goals. We did hit the stepping stones to get to 20, 30, 40, and then finally 50, 10, 50 team members. And do you know what the best thing about setting a vision, sharing it with a team, asking, because the beauty of our business is physios, good physios, no, no other good physios. So we ask them to refer their friends, and there's a self-selecting way of filtering out the crap people before we even start and get good referrals to come, to come in. So we worked closely with our team. And we did build, and we were able to achieve and get to 50 team members by 2012. And the best thing about the struggle, the mess we'd come from, the struggle of the pivot, and then achieving the goal, was the opportunity to celebrate. Never, ever, ever miss an opportunity to celebrate. The beauty of goals and visions that you uh, share with your team, you set with your team, move towards and um, make progress, two steps forward, one step back, all that sort of stuff, quick side by step. Life is about oscillations, up and down. That's the way it works. But when we get there, we can celebrate them and we can say thank you and we can appreciate the journey that we're on. I think that's one of the beauties of having a really clear vision and, and moving forward. Make some sense? Great. All right. I, let's move on to the next of the four secrets. Execute relentlessly. The hardcore non-culture people, there, so in the room, I suspect, because in every room like this, there are people who are already doing a whole lot of stuff that create a great culture. There are people who understand a lot of these things but haven't got there yet, and that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. Uh, the way we get there takes, takes time. We need to be patient. And there are some people who are like, no, nah, that culture stuff is crap. No? Okay. And they're the ones who challenge me. One, they know that it's crap. And two, Tristan, execute relentlessly. No, shouldn't be in your system. So they know culture so well that they don't do it. And they know that my system should not have execute relentlessly in it because it doesn't fit. Purpose, values, yeah, that's the soft stuff. Vision, yeah, I understand that. Show more love, of course. Make it beautiful for everyone. But this execute relentlessly, that belongs to them in their hard-nosed uh, environments where they have everyone's noses to the, gr the grindstone. Okay? And this is where I challenge them. I challenge them, business is a marathon. Business is something we need to make in an enjoyable long-term journey, and we absolutely need to execute relentlessly over and over and over again the systems that we know work well. One quick example of this, 
that I'll share with you is in recruitment. We're going to need people, we know that. But the la you do all this work, set your vision and values, get your vision, uh, sorry, purpose and values, get your vision in place, get everyone on board, whether you've got one person or two people or three or four or five or 50, you do all this work and then you have a hiring process that lets someone in that doesn't, it isn't aligned to your team, isn't aligned to your culture and it gets diluted so quickly, so quickly. Zappos, who knows of Zappos? Okay. Zappos, very famous for their culture. Shoe, online shoe store in America, now owned by Amazon. They call people who don't fit their culture polluters. <laughs> I think they're right. I think they're right. People who pollute the culture can cause a phenomenal amount of uh, pain frustration and distract from the important job that we've got of moving closer to bringing our vision to life. If we're spending more and more time dealing with polluters, then we are distracted from growing our businesses and growing our people. And in my belief, particularly in the service industry and the service business that I lead, I need to grow our business by increasing the quality and quantity of people over time. Yes, we need more people, but it's my job to coach and build the quality over time. So a robust recruitment system is one way to execute relentlessly and being very, very robust. And so I'm not saying it has to be too spectacular. I'm saying it has to have multi steps. So some critical steps of a, a robust recruitment system in my belief is a multi step process with multi people doing the selection. And what I mean by that is we want people to have to move through a process of applying and then and the basics, applying and a phone screen and an interview and then possibly something else, a test or some, something else and then possibly another interview, the reference checks, but multi-steps that we can move through. And this might seem mean, seem mean, but we want to see them trip up in a metaphorical sense because everyone puts their best foot forward when they apply for a job. But we want to give them time, for as much time as we can, for them to let us know the real person that's beneath there. And you can't get that in one interview or one phone screen. It takes time. And I don't believe you can even get it from one person in your team. And this is hard when you've got a small team, I get it. But as you've got multiple people, I'd encourage you to take the lead in recruitment, but then bring other people and allow them to give them their view as to whether that person fits your team or not. Because multiple, multiple people assessing and giving feedback is a way to have a, an execute relentlessly around a robust recruitment process. Does that make some sense? Great. All right, let's quickly talk about the, the show more love part of the system, and then we'll, um, we'll cut, Go to, um, we'll go to some questions. So show more love. In my little book over here, this one, in my book over here is a little red card. It's got a, some of you'll be able to see it, some of you won't. There's an old lady on the front with rollers in her hair and it says five years on the front of it. This card, belongs to a member of my team called Gareth. And Gareth has got his fifth year physio co anniversary next week. And so I need to write on this card on the way back on this weekend, dear Gareth, happy fifth TPC anniversary. Happy fifth TPC anniversary. Can't believe we've been working together for five years. I just love it. Thanks so much for your hard work. All the best, Tristan. I'll give it to Jess, my assistant in my office. She'll stuff it in a little red envelope, put a stamp on it. We'll cross our fingers and hope for the best at Australia Post. We'll get it to Gareth's house on time. Gareth will receive it sometime later this week and he might stuff it in the bin. Or he might read it and think, oh, that's nice. Or he might stick it on his coffee table. Or he might even put it on the fridge. And Gareth's housemates or wife or kids, or whoever, might read it, 
And when Gareth is hurrying off to work every day because he wants to help more seniors stay mobile, safe and happy, but his kids or family just don't get it, when they see a note from the boss that says, love your work, Gareth, maybe, just maybe, they're a little bit more bought into the process. Maybe they're a bit more understanding of what Gareth is, is about. On the flip side, Gareth shares it with his family and they all are wrapped, they all feel good about it. Then they put it away and Gareth goes back to work for the next couple of months and then it's now February, in about April or, or just after Easter, Gareth has a crap day or a crap week at work. They happen, they happen. And Gareth comes home and on the weekend, he's like, maybe I'll find another job. And at that moment, maybe, just maybe, if that card was, was shared by the people in that house, there might be someone in Gareth's house on the couch on a Friday night knocking back a glass of wine that says, hey Gareth, you sure? Pretty sure it's a couple of months ago you were bloody loving the joint. And I'm pretty sure your boss seems to, be, seems to care for you. So if there's a problem, how about you sort it out, or you go and have a chat with them and, and, and figure it out. And just like that, there's an influencer in Gareth's life who is not on my payroll. He's not on anyone's payroll. It's a family member who is helping to support the team member through the tough times. Now, I don't know if that's going to work, but I'm willing to write on a card and send an envelope just to test it. It's the small things like that that can help you to show more love and communicate people to make it really important. So every team member gets a card handwritten from me on their anniversary. Every team member gets a Christmas card from me. I no longer do the birthday cards. There's too many. There are too many. So the team leaders uh, write birthday cards to their team. Uh, one more example of showing more love. Never underestimate the, the power of a bunch of flowers. We've got our ear to the ground to try and discover when good stuff is happening in team members' lives or when bad stuff is happening in team members' lives. And a bunch of flowers, typically for females, not always good flowers for the blokes, but hey, some, some blokes like flowers, so we'll send flowers. Um, but maybe it's a six pack of beers or a hamper or, or something like that, some magazines, whatever it might be. But identifying a reason to send someone, some, a little message that says, dear Dennis, I hear things aren't going great at the moment. I know you're having some, having some leave. Can't wait to have you back when the time is right. Let us know how we can help out. Love from the Physio Co family. As simple as that, we do our best. We don't pry, but we support and we identify things because a strong culture has got ups and downs. You have to mention them. You have to notice them. Another example. Uh, we've talked about opportunity to celebrate. Never miss one. And the last thing that I'll leave you with is if you do all this work to build a business and hopefully to build a strong culture as well, I implore you to please take a moment to capture the memories. Don't let the months and years go past and all this work and all these memories without some way of capturing them. The way this is borrowed completely from Zappos. Borrowed means stolen, by the way. <laughs> But this is completely borrowed from Zappos, and that is it's called a culture book. It's effectively a yearbook. Every year we put together a little yearbook, we, some photos of our conference, some photos of our parties, some photos of some events, some new starters, and I personally email everyone and say, Dear Gareth, what's been so good about 2017? What have you liked? What have you not liked? He, some people reply, some people don't. We put their responses. Don't, we don't modify them. We tidy up a typo or there, here or there. Uh, but, um, but we, and we print it and we give this little printed book to every member of our team every year and they love it. They absolutely love it. Now it doesn't have to be a printed book, it could be a website, it could be a video, it could be, could be all sorts of things, but capture the memories. Alrighty, they are the four secrets. Our time together has come to an end. Checklist is really, really, really important. Uh, Ivy's got a copy for you, you will get a copy of the checklist. Um, this system is available. I did put this together in a book that I released last year. If you're interested, you can either head over to tristanwhite.com.au or we've got a few copies here if you're, if you're interested. But please let me leave you with the last bit as Dale joins me to say, 
Whatever you do, remember why you're in business. Remember the George that I spoke to you about before and find a reason to understand the purpose because the purpose will move you to your vision and your values will help to guide your way. I believe that we're all building a house of some description, core purpose, core values, and a vision will help you to build this culture. And the beauty is if you set up this framework for your team members, they can exist in this freedom within boundaries environment. They will know the purpose of why they're there, the behaviors expected, and the vision where you're headed, and then your team members can exist in this environment. Thank you very much.